Well, hello, everybody. All good things on this earth will come to an end, but once we get to heaven, everything good will last forever. Amen. This is the last session. Uh, actually, we have some testimonies afterwards, but uh, this is the last session of instruction. And what we're going to study, uh, you have received just a few minutes ago. The title of it is The Risk of Eternal Loss. I made this presentation at uh, GYC uh, in January of this year. But uh, at GYC, uh, the time that you are allowed is abbreviated uh, because uh, 3ABN is there and there's a lot of preliminaries. And so there's quite a bit of information that I was not able to present there. And I do want this to be on camera for Secrets Unsealed, so uh, I'm going to share what I shared there at GYC. I want to make something very, very clear as I begin, and that is that I firmly believe that the Godhead is composed of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some people were surprised that I didn't mention the Holy Spirit in my talk there at GYC. The reason is because that was not my subject. My subject was the relationship between the Father and the Son. So it's not that I don't believe in the Holy Spirit. I certainly believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit is a person. I believe that the Holy Spirit is God. But that is not the subject that I presented there, and it's not the subject that I'm going to present here. You know, if you read the first chapter of Patriarchs and Prophets, you'll find that Ellen White doesn't mention the Holy Spirit even once. And yet she, the whole chapter deals with the relationship between the Father and the Son. So I figure if Ellen White can talk about the relationship between the Father and the Son without mentioning the Holy Spirit, I can also talk about the Father and the Son without mentioning the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a subject for a different time in a different place. Are you understanding this note of explanation? Yes. I was not able to make this explanation at GYC, but because of the discussion, uh, I want to make it absolutely clear here. Okay, we want to begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our study. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here this afternoon for this last session of this course on the spirit of prophecy. It's been wonderful being here with these people, seeing the interest and uh, the, the importance that has been dedicated to this class. I just ask, Father, that as we study this last subject, that you will be with us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to understand the tremendous importance of what we're going to study this afternoon. And this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The first thing that I want to deal with, you'll notice the title, The Heavenly Relationship Between the Father and the Son. Before the creation of the angels, the inhabitants of other worlds, and the creation of man, God the Father and God the Son had a very unique and special relationship. What I would like to do is draw ten points regarding this intimate relationship between the Father and the Son. The first point that I would like to mention is that Jesus was a distinct personality from the Father with His own individuality. In other words, God the Father and God the Son are two separate individuals. They are two distinct persons. We find this in the Bible as well as in the spirit of prophecy. In John chapter 17 and verse 5, we find these words, And now, O Father, glorify me together with Yourself with the glory which I had with You before the world was. Obviously, the Son cannot be with the Father and at the same time be the Father. And so you have two distinct persons, two individualities. In verse 22 of this prayer that Jesus raised to His Father, we find these words, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Now, the apostles were twelve. Jesus prayed, I want the twelve to be one, even as you and I are one. So if twelve can equal one, two can equal one as well. So Jesus was not 
speaking numerically, Jesus was speaking, as we'll see, in terms of unity. As the disciples were twelve distinct persons or individualities, the Father and the Son are each an individual, each a person. Ellen White confirms this idea. In Ministry of Healing, page 422, she stated, The unity that exists between Christ and His disciples does not destroy the personality of either. They are one in purpose, in mind, in character, but not in person. It is thus that God and Christ are one. So the first point is that the Father and the Son are two distinct persons or individuals. The second point that I want us to notice is that even though the Father and the Son were two, the Bible describes them as one. They are one in terms of character and power. They are not one in terms of individuality. The Bible is very, very clear that the Father and the Son are one in terms of unity, two persons in unity. Notice John chapter 10 and verse 30, a very short verse. Here Jesus is speaking and He says, I and the Father are one. That doesn't mean they're the same person. It means that they are in perfect unity even though they are two persons. Ellen White corroborates and confirms this point. In Youth Instructor, December 16, 1897, she had this to say, From eternity there was a complete unity between the Father and the Son. They were two, see there? They were two, and I love the way she puts this, yet little short of being identical. Two in individuality, yet one in spirit and heart and character. So she says two, yet little short of being one. They were so similar. The third point that I want us to notice is that the Father and the Son are both equally God. They are both 100% divine. Jesus is not a lesser God than the Father. He is equal to the Father. This is a vitally important point. The Son is not inferior to the Father. He is just as much God as the Father is. We find this, for example, in John 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is that Word? It's Jesus. Because in verse 14 it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So this is clearly telling us that Jesus, the Word, was God. Jesus is God. Ellen White, of course, confirms what we find in Scripture. In Councils for the Church, page 76, she stated this, God is the Father of Christ. Christ is the Son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the Father. All the counsels of God are opened to His Son, equal to His Father. In the book God's Amazing Grace, page 160, we find another statement that basically has the same idea. This Savior was the brightness of His Father's glory and the express image of His person. He possessed divine majesty, perfection, and excellence. He was equal with God. It pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Once again, equal with the Father. In Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 38 and 39, we find once again the same idea expressed, the equality between the Father and the Son. It says there, Christ was the Son of God. He had been one with Him before the angels were called into existence. He had ever stood at the right hand of the Father. You'll notice that the Father is at the center of the throne, and the Son is at the right hand of the Father. In other words, Jesus is the co-regent. He's the co-ruler, but the Father is the supreme ruler, even though they 
are both God and equal. The fourth point that I want us to notice is that there is a special intimacy between the Father and the Son. The Bible tells us that the Son was in the bosom of the Father. Notice what we find in John chapter 1 and verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. The Son is in the bosom of the Father. Ellen White, always in harmony with Scripture, confirms that point when she states in Review and Herald, February 28, 1888, He, that is the Father, permitted Him, Jesus, to leave where? the bosom of His love, the adoration of the angels, to suffer shame, insult, humiliation, hatred, and death. Was Jesus in the bosom of the Father before He became incarnate, according to this text? Absolutely. He was in the bosom of the Father before He came to this earth. The fifth point that I want us to notice is that Jesus is the express image of the Father's person. Never in the Bible will you find that the Father is the image of the Son. The Son is the image of the Father. I want you to notice uh, what we find in uh, the book, Lift Him Up, page 24. The Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. Remember that. He was next in authority. So who was the supreme authority? The Father was the supreme authority, even though they're equal. The Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. Now notice, He was in the express image of His Father, not in features alone, but in perfection of character. So Jesus was the express image of His Father. Now we need to understand something about that expression, express image. In the New Testament, there are several texts that say that we are to be create, that we were created in the image of God, and we are to be recreated in the image of God. The word that is used there is the word akon, where we get the word icon from. But when the Bible speaks about Jesus being the image of His Father, a special word is used in Hebrews chapter one and verse three. It is the Greek word charakter. What word do we get from character? The word character. The express image of the Father means that Jesus is the express character of the Father. He's the express image of the Father. Both the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy tell us that the Son is the image of the Father. Point number six. Jesus is the Father's second self. Like Father like Son. John 14 and verse 9, Jesus said to him, he's talking to Philip, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Is Jesus like the second self of the Father, that whoever sees the Son is seeing the Father? Absolutely. Ellen White, in a statement that we read before, confirms the same idea when she states, Youth Instructor, December 16, 1897, from eternity there was a complete unity between the Father and the Son. They were two, yet little short of being what? Identical. See, the Father's second self. Two in individuality, yet one in spirit and heart and character. Point number seven. Because Jesus is the eternal Son of God, He is of the same substance as the Father. He's composed of the same stuff. Might it be an exaggeration to say that He has the same DNA as the Father? I don't think it would be a great exaggeration because in Philippians 2 verse 6, we find that it tells us that Jesus was the same stuff as the Father. He was in the form of God. And that word form in the New Testament is not talking about the shape of something. The word form there refers to the substance or essence of which an individual is composed. Ellen White, 
in harmony with Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6, expresses it this way, Signs of the Times, November 27, 1893. I and the Father are one. She's going to comment on this verse. The words of Christ were full of deep meaning as He put forth the claim that He and the Father, listen carefully, were of what? Of one substance, possessing the same attributes. In Review and Herald, April 5, 1906, we find this remarkable statement. Christ was God essentially. Now when it says essentially, it's not saying, well, He was essentially God. Not in that sense. The word essentially means in His essence or in His substance. So Ellen White is saying Christ was God essentially in His essence and in what? In the highest sense. Point number eight. It is the Father's glory that shines on the face of Jesus. Jesus is a reflection of the Father's glory. Notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. There we are told that Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory. You never find that the Father is the brightness of the Son's glory. It is always the Son who is the reflection of the Father's glory. John 1.14 adds the same thought. It says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as what? As of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So whose glory was the glory of Jesus? It was the glory of the Father. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, we find this verse, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Ellen White, as usual, confirms this same idea. The Christology of Ellen White is in harmony, perfect harmony with the Bible. She states in the book Medical Ministry, page 19, He was the brightness of whose glory? Of the Father's glory, the express image of His person. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 115, she states, In Him is gathered all the glory of whom? All the glory of the Father, the fullness of the Godhead. He is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of His person. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, page 200, Ellen White repeats the same thought. This Savior was the brightness of His Father's glory and the express image of His person. He possessed divine majesty, perfection, and excellence. He was equal with God. Point number nine. Even though Jesus and the Father are on a level of equality as persons, the Son is subject to the Father's authority as His head. Is it possible for someone to be equal with someone else and to be under that someone else's authority? Absolutely. Notice what we find uh, clearly revealed in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. It says there, basically, that the head of Christ is the Father. Christ is the head of the man, and the man is the head of the woman. So the Father is the head of Christ, according to Scripture. In other words, Christ is subject, is submissive to His Father's will. In eternity past, in the present, and in the future, both the Father and the Son have authority and dominion. But the Father has absolute authority, and the Son has delegated authority. Never has the Son acted independently of the Father. He has ever been subject to His Father's authority and His Father's will. Before the creation of angels and man, Jesus was already subject to the Father's authority. And you say, how do you know that? Well, let's read a couple of statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. The first one is found in the book Story of Redemption, page 13. This is too clear to be misunderstood. It says there, in, uh, once again, 
in uh, the book Story of Redemption, page 13, the great creator, who is the great creator? The Father, notice. The great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might, that who might? God the Father might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon His Son. Who's conferring honor upon whom? The Father and the Son. The Son was seated on the throne with His Father, and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The Father then made known that it was ordained by Himself that Christ, His Son, should be equal with Himself so that wherever was the presence of His Son, it was His own presence. See, that's the idea of the other self, of the Father. She continues writing, The word of the Son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. Now notice this, His Son, He had invested with authority. Who invested who? The Father invested the Son with authority. He, His Son, He had invested with authority to command the heavenly host. Especially was His Son to work in union with Himself, and we know that because in Genesis the Father says to the Son, let us make man in our image, in the anticipated creation of the earth, in every living thing that should exist upon the earth. Now listen carefully. His Son would carry out His will. Whose will does the Son carry out? The Father's. the Father's will. And His purposes, whose purposes would the Son carry out? The Father's. the Father's purposes. But would do nothing of Himself alone, the Father's will would be fulfilled in Him. Was the, was the Son subject to the authority of the Father and to the Father's will? Unquestionable, according to the spirit of prophecy. There's another statement that adds details. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. The King of the universe. The other statement says the Great Creator. And we already studied this. In what sense is God the Father the Great Creator? He's the one that devised the plan, and by His will creation took place, but He does it through His Son. The King of the universe summoned the heavenly host before Him, that in their presence he might set forth the true position of His Son and show the relation He sustained to all created beings. So who's giving the explanations here? The Father. The Son of God shared the Father's throne. But where was the Son sitting? We already noticed, to the right hand. The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both. Before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the King declared. Who is the King? The Father, the King declared that none but Christ, the only begotten of God, could fully enter into His purposes, and to Him it was committed to execute it the mighty counsels of His will. Of whose will? Of the Father's will. The Son of God had wrought, now listen carefully, was the Son subject to the Father even before the angels were created? Listen to this, it says, The Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven. He was subject to the Father even when He created the angels. She continues saying, And to Him, as well as to God, their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. But in all this, he would not seek power or exaltation for Himself, contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute His purposes of beneficence and love. Was the Son, son subject to the authority of the Father even before the creation of the angels? I don't know how else you can read this. When I preached this sermon at GYC, a president of, of a whole division wrote a blurb in the division paper saying that what had been presented at this convention, he didn't mention where it was or who it was that was preaching, uh, don't believe that Jesus was subordinate to the Father in eternity past. But the fact is that Ellen White states that he was. And there are texts in the Bible that point the same thing. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Hebrews 1, verse 3, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, make it very clear 
that everything was created by the Father's will through the Son. By the way, after His incarnation, was Jesus still subject to the Father? Uh, have you ever read Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18? Notice what Jesus says. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, He's speaking to His disciples, All authority, excuse me? All authority, what? Has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Who gave it to Him? The Father. In fact, you can read Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. It says, Therefore the Father has highly exalted Him, and given Him the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Father highly exalts Him, and the Father gives Him the name that is above every name. Even after the resurrection, He is subject to the authority of the Father. Is Jesus going to be subject to the authority of the Father when all of sin is eradicated from the universe? Yes. yes. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 28, Now when all things are made subject to Him, then the Son Himself will also be subject to Him who put all things under His feet, that God may be all in all. In eternity future, the Son will be subject to the Father. And some people say, well, I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry. But we have our heads screwed on wrong because we think that subjection is inferiority. If you take orders from anyone, if you do anyone's will, then that person is superior to you. I'll tell you, surprise, surprise, Jesus said that the servant is the greatest. The one who descends is the one who is highest. The problem is with our way of thinking that subjection is bad. But subjection existed before sin even came in the universe because the Son subjected Himself to His Father's will. Are you with me? Yes. Point number 10. It was a delight for the Son to subject Himself before His Father because He knew that His Father loved Him. Is subjection quite simple when you know that the person you're subjecting yourself to loves you? Absolutely. You can read in the Gospel of John several texts where Jesus says, The Father loves me. Therefore I do what the, what the Father tells me because I know that He loves me. So the Son is subject to the Father, not as a slave, but it's a voluntary submission because He knows that His Father loves Him. Amen. Now let's transition to the time that Adam and Eve were created. God worked the better part of six days, and everything that He made was perfect and beautiful. As the crowning act of creation, God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living being. Adam then named the animals. As he did so, he noticed that each animal had its counterpart like itself, but he did not have a companion such as him. We find this in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 20. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. So God then gives Adam the first general anesthesia of history. The Bible says that he falls into a deep sleep, and God performed the first surgery and left no scar. God, from one of the ribs, created a woman. And he brought her to the man, God's gift to Adam. We find in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22, Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now you can imagine what it was like when Adam opened his eyes from the general anesthesia that he had been under. Wow! His mouth falls open. And he sees this beautiful woman, he says, Wow, one just like me. And then the story tells us that God performed the first marriage of human history, the marriage of Adam and Eve. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and discover some very interesting details. I believe that as you study Genesis, it is inevitable to reach the conclusion that God wanted the relationship of Adam and Eve to be an earthly reflection 
of the relationship between the Father and the Son. In other words, God wanted to show, He wanted to explain in a miniature way, just like He explained the heavenly sanctuary with a miniature, what the relationship was between He and His Son. Notice Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Then God, who is this that is speaking here? It's God the Father, folks. Early writings 145. Then God said, is He talking to Himself? No, who is He talking to? The to the Son, to Jesus. Then God said, let us, that would be Father and Son, right? Us make man. Now, I need to tell you something about the word man. In Genesis 1 and 2, the word man is always used with the definite article, the man, and it applies only to masculine, except in this one case. The use of man here is a generic use. It does not have the definite article. In other words, it's man here includes man and woman, not only the masculine man. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And I'm just reflecting what the Hebrew says. So, he says, let us, father and son, make man, that is, Adam and Eve, how? In our image, according to our likeness. Now let me ask you, is the relationship between Adam and Eve a reflection of the relationship between the Father and the Son? Yes, not only are they individually in the image of God, but the relationship between the two is a reflection of the relationship between the Father and the Son. That's why the Father says to the Son, let us, both of us, make man, generically, man and woman, in our image. In other words, they are going to reflect the relationship that exists between us. So it says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion. Let me ask you, did the Father and the Son both have dominion? Yes or no? Sure. But who had absolute dominion, according to what we notice? The Father is sitting on the center of the throne. The Son has dominion, but it's the Father who is the head and has absolute dominion. He's the great creator. He is the king of the universe, according to what we read. Adam and Eve both have dominion. But let me ask you, who would be the head in this relationship? Not Jesus, Adam. <laughs> now notice, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So what I want you to notice now is that the relationship between Adam and Eve was to be a small scale model of the relationship between the Father and the Son. So let's draw that parallel now. The creation story makes it absolutely clear that Adam and Eve were two distinct persons. Is that true? Adam existed before Eve, so they cannot be the same person. They are two distinct persons, just like the Father and the Son are two. But let me ask you, does the creation story, this is point number two, does the creation story state clearly that Adam and Eve were one? Yes. In fact, God says they will no longer be two, but they will be one. Two persons, but one. Does that begin to ring an interesting bell? The Father and the Son are two, but they were also what? They were also one. Now let me ask you, Adam and Eve, did they stand on a level of equality? Were they both equally human? Are they both referred to with a generic word, man, just like the Son and the Father are called God? Yes. Was Eve a lesser order of humanity? No, she was 100% man in the generic sense of the word. Were Jesus and the Father both God? Were they equal? Absolutely. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46, Ellen White confirms this point. Eve was created from a rib taken from Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as what? As an equal to be loved 
and protected by Him. So was Eve equal with Adam? Absolutely. Was there a special intimacy between Adam and Eve? Was she taken from a place close to Adam's bosom, close to his heart? Absolutely. In fact, Deuteronomy 13 verse 6 calls the wife, the wife of thy bosom, interestingly enough. And that expression is used more than once in the Old Testament, the wife of your bosom, because the wife was to be very close to the bosom. Was the son close to the bosom of the father? Absolutely. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46. We just read this statement. Let's read it again. He was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. A rib was taken, which is really where? In the chest. It's near to the bosom. It's near to the heart. Lo and behold, Eve was created to be Adam's second self. Notice what Ellen White had to say about this in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46. A part of man, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh, she was his what? Second self. Adam could say, he who has seen Eve has seen me, and vice versa. So as a part of man, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh, she was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. Let me ask you, was Eve co-substantial with Adam? Did she have Adam's DNA? She had only Adam's DNA. You know, we have the DNA of father and mother. But she had only the DNA of Adam just like Jesus had only the DNA of His Father. Obviously, I'm using DNA in quotation marks to emphasize that they were of the same substance. Notice Genesis 2.23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Do you know that the Bible says that Man was created the glory of God, but the woman was created to be the glory of man. Just like the Father has His glory, the Son is to reflect the Father's glory. You see, now where does the Bible say such a thing? Notice under point number eight, the Apostle Paul explains, For a man indeed ought not cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the what? the glory of man. So you say, I don't like that. I want my own glory. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus is perfectly happy reflecting the glory of His Father. And so when God created Adam and then created Eve, Eve was to be the glory of whom? She was to be the glory of Adam. And by the way, the Apostle Paul does not mention that Eve was created in the image of God because man was created in the image of God, and Eve derived the image of God through Adam. A very important point that also is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 7. Point number 9. Let me ask you, even though Adam and Eve were equal, was Adam the head of Eve? Was Eve supposed to be subject to the authority of Adam? Yes. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is whom? Man. And the head of Christ is God. Let me ask you this. Is it a bad thing that the Father is the head of Christ? Is that a bad thing? Is it a bad thing that Christ is the head of the man? No, but it is a bad thing that the man is the head of the woman. It's absurd. There's no problem. The, the son considers the father his head. The man has no problems with Christ being his head. So the woman should have no problem with the man being the head. Amen. The problem is we don't like that today. 
in this egalitarian world, in this world where culture dictates that all roles are equal and interchangeable. We don't like the idea that the man is the head and the woman is to be subject to the authority of the man. But clearly that's what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul says, wives be subject to your own husbands. But then the interesting thing is, wives would have no problem being subject to their husbands if their husbands loved their wives. Because the Apostle Paul says, wives, be subject to your husbands in Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. But then he says, husbands, love your wives. That's a reflection of the relationship between the father and the son. The father loved his son, and the son says, I have no problems subjecting myself to my father. Incidentally, have you ever noticed in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, that there's one who has no head. The father has no head. I'm not talking about physical head now. The father has no head, and the woman is his head of no one because the chain ends at the woman. The father is the head of Jesus. Jesus is the head of the man, and the man is the head of the woman. The woman is head of no one, and the father has no head. That's the chain of command that God has established. Is that point clear? Now, let's talk about Eve's sin. This is going to become very, very interesting. Eve committed two great sins. And obviously when I say sins, I know that the great sin was eating from the tree. That was actually the act of sin. But there are two things actually that ultimately led her to eat. First of all, she acted independently of Adam doing her own thing. And secondly, even though she had a human nature, she wanted to ascend to a higher position. She wanted to ascend to the position of God. Two points. Acted independently of her head, Adam, and wanted to ascend to a higher position than what God had given her. Her sin was primarily selfishness. Notice Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53 and page 54. Here's the separation part. The angels had cautioned Eve to beware of what? Separating herself from her husband while occupied in their daily labor in the garden. With him, she would be in less danger from temptation than if she were alone. But absorbed in her pleasing task, she unconsciously what? Wandered from his side she became independent of Adam, her head. We find also in Story of Redemption, page 32, Eve unconsciously at first did what? Separated from her husband in her employment. When she became aware of the fact, she felt that there might be danger, but again she thought herself secure. Even if she did not remain what? close by, his si by the side of her husband. She had wisdom and strength to know if evil came and to meet it. I can act independently of my head and I can be just fine. The second big mistake that she committed before eating from the tree is that she wanted to ascend to a higher sphere than where God had placed her. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 59, we find Eve had been perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home. But like restless modern Eves, she flattered herself with the hope of entering a what? A higher sphere than, God, than that which God had assigned her. In attempting to, what again? To rise above her original position, she fell far below it. All who are unwilling to take up cheerfully their life duties in accordance with whose plan? With God's plan, the plan that God has assigned, in other words, will reach a similar result. In their efforts to reach, notice again, to reach positions for which God has not fitted them, many are leaving vacant the place where they might be a blessing. In their desire for a, here it is again, the same idea, for a higher sphere, many have sacrificed true womanly dignity and nobility of character and have left undone their very work that heaven appointed them. 
two big mistakes. Number one, acting independently of her head and saying, I can do just fine by myself. And number two, wanting to ascend to a higher sphere than where she was. What was Adam's great mistake? I know that his big sin was eating from the tree. However, there's something else involved here. Like the father's most precious possession was his own son, Eve was the most precious thing that Adam had. Would you agree with that? How could Adam give up the one who was one with him? How could he give up the one who was his image, his own substance, his own glory, and the image of God through him? How could he tear from himself the one who was close to his bosom? How could he live without his beloved Eve? How could he lose her? How could he conceive of ever being separated from her forever? He was thinking only of himself. Ellen White describes it this way. Conflict and Courage, page 16. There was a terrible struggle in his mind. He mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side. But now the deed was done, he must be separated from her whose society had been his joy. How could he have it thus? Adam had enjoyed the companionship of God and of holy angels. He had looked upon the glory of the Creator. He understood the high destiny open to the human race should they remain faithful to God. Yet all these blessings were lost sight of in the fear of losing that one gift which in his eyes outvalued every other. Would that be true, true of the Father and the Son? Would the Son be that which of, is of most value to God the Father? Yes. Now notice, love, gratitude, loyalty to the Creator, all was overborne by a love to Eve. She was a part of himself. She was co-substantial, and he could not endure the thought of separation. Now let's review the relationship between the father and the son. As we have seen, the relationship of Adam and Eve was a reflection of the relationship between the father and the son. Both were distinct persons. One, Jesus was one with the father. As the Son, He was the same substance as the Father. He was flesh of His flesh and bone of His bone, so to speak. Jesus was in the bosom of His Father. The Son was the Father's second self. The Son was the Father's express image. The Son was the Father's glory. So now, God the Father faced a dilemma. He had to make a decision similar to the decision that Adam had to make in the Garden of Eden. Would the Father be willing to give up the most prized possession in heaven, His most intimate partner, as Adam had to make that choice as well? Would He give up His own Son at the risk of eternal loss, or would He keep Him to Himself? It was a great struggle for the Father. Don't think that it was easy for the father to decide to give up that which was most precious, most precious, in contrast to Adam, who was not willing to give up that which was most precious to him. Ellen White explains the struggle of the father. Signs of the Times, November 4, 1908. Before the father, this is when man sinned, before the father, he pleaded in the sinner's behalf. While the host of heaven awaited the result with an intensity of interest that words cannot express. Long continued was that mysterious communing, the counsel of peace for the fallen sons of men. The plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is a lamb foreordained before the foundation of the world. But now notice, was it a struggle for Adam to give up Eve? Was he willing to give her up? No. But now notice, yet it was a struggle even with the king of the universe, to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. Because he felt that he was going to lose him forever. He could lose him forever. In Desire of Ages, page 49, 
Ellen White adds to this by saying, God permitted His Son to come, a helpless babe, subject to the weakness of humanity. He permitted Him to meet life's perils in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it. And now notice, at the risk of failure and eternal loss, at the risk of losing His Son forever, His most precious partner, the one who was His image and His glory, co-substantial. There was a risk that He could lose Him forever. She continues saying, The heart of a human father yearns over his son. He looks into the face of his little child and trembles at the thought of life's peril. He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power, to hold him back from temptation and conflict, to meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk. God gave His only begotten Son that the path of life might be made sure for our little ones. Herein is love. Wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth. The Father did the opposite of Adam. In fact, Ellen White states in Christ's Object Lessons, page 196, for our redemption, heaven itself was imperiled. The security of the universe was imperiled, and yet the Father was willing to give up the Son, which Adam was not willing to do. God did the opposite of Adam. He was willing to give up His most prized possession in heaven at the risk of losing Him forever. Romans 8 verse 32 says as much, He who did not spare His own Son but delivered Him up for us all. How shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? In Review and Herald, July 9, 1895, we find this statement, The Eternal Father, the Unchangeable One, gave His only begotten Son, listen now carefully, tore from His bosom him who was made in the express image of His person and sent Him down to earth to reveal how greatly He loved mankind. He loved mankind more than He loved His own Son. He gave up His Son. Now let's complete the st statement that we began reading before. Remember uh, Ellen White said before the Father He pleaded in the sinner's behalf? Let's complete that statement now that is found in Signs of the Times, November 4, 1908. Before the Father, He pleaded in the sinner's behalf. While the host of heaven awaited the result with an intensity of, intensity of interest that words cannot express, long continued was the, that mysterious communing, the counsel of peace for the fallen sons of men. The plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is foreordained, is a lamb foreordained before the foundation of the world. Yet it was a struggle even with the king of the universe to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. Now comes the part that we didn't quote. But, it was a struggle, but God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. All the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love Him, who can know the depths of that love which passeth knowledge? Through endless ages, immortal minds seeking to comprehend the mystery of that incomprehensible love will wonder and adore. Amen. So let me ask you, was the experience of Adam a reflection of the experience of God? Yes, but Adam made a different choice. He could not give up the co-substantial one. The Father says, I will give him up. Now here's another question. What was the son's dilemma? It was the counterpart of Eve. On the other hand, the attitude of Jesus was the opposite of Eve. He was equal to God, yet instead of choosing to ascend like Eve, He chose to descend. In contrast to Eve wanting to ascend to be God, Jesus chose to descend and become a man. He left His crown, scepter, and royal throne royal robe, and came down, all the way down. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 states, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. A better translation is he did not consider equality of, with God as something to be ha hang on to, something to be uh, something that he would say, oh this is mine and I'm not giving it up, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Did Jesus ascend or descend? Just the opposite of what Eve wanted to do. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Desire of ages 22 and 23, but he chose to give back the scepter into the Father's hands and to step down from the throne of the universe that he might bring light to the benighted and life to the perishing. Now was this a real sacrifice that the Father and the Son had to make? Listen to what we find in Desire of Ages 753. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be what? this separation was to be eternal. Jesus was willing to descend to this earth even though He felt that He might be separated for eternity from His Father. Let me ask you, did Jesus ever act independently from His head? Eve did, didn't she? She wanted to ascend and she said, I can fend on my own. Jesus throughout His whole ministry said, not my will be done, but yours. I do not do my own will, but the will of the one who has sent me. The Father and the Son gave a lesson of the opposite of what Adam and Eve actually did. Now we're going to have to continue for a few minutes with the taping because I'm not quite finished, and this has already been broadcast on 3ABN, so bear with me. We have a story in the Bible that illustrates what we've studied this afternoon. It's the story in Genesis 22. Have you ever read the story in Genesis 22? God says to Abraham, 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 take your son, your only son. That word only is the Hebrew word yachid, which means your precious one, your, special, your unique son. Take your son, your unique son, the one that you love, and sacrifice him on the mountain that I will show you. Was it a struggle for Abraham to give up his son? You see, this is a, this is a small scale earthly illustration of what we've been talking about. Abraham had his struggle, but he decided that he was going to do what God said. So he got the wood, and he got the knife, and he got the fire, and he began the trip to Mount Moriah. He was willing to give up his own precious son. And when they arrived at the mountain, his son had to make a decision. His son had to make the decision whether he would place himself in the hands of his father, whether he would do the will of his father and be willing to be placed on the altar to be sacrificed. The father struggled to give him up and the son submitted to his father's authority in willing to give up his life. So we find this illustration in Scripture. The question is now, how much does God love us? His love is infinite. Do you know the Bible tells us, and the Spirit of Prophecy affirms also, that this whole struggle of the Father and the willingness of the Son would have taken place if only one soul had wanted to be saved? Allow me to read you a few statements as we bring this to a close. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 209. Next time we're walking down the street and we see that soul, remember Jesus would have died for that just one. One soul saved in the kingdom of God is of more value than all earthly riches. We are answerable to God for the souls of those with whom we are brought in contact, and the closer our connections with our fellow men, the greater our responsibility. 
we are one great brotherhood, and the welfare of our fellow men should be our great interest. We have not one moment to lose. If we have been careless in this matter, it is high time we were now in earnest to redeem the time, lest the blood of souls be found on our garments. As children of God, none of us are excused from taking part in the great work of Christ in the salvation of our fellow men. Amen. Now, let me ask you this question. How do you buy something that is of infinite value? One soul is of infinite value. The only way is by paying an infinite price. <laughs> One soul is of infinite value. And so Jesus was willing to pay an infinite price. Notice God's Amazing Grace, page 173. The wealth of earth dwindles into insignificance when compared with the worth of a single soul. The wealth of earth, folks, the whole planet dwindles into insignificance when compared with the worth of a single soul for whom our Lord and Master died. He who weigheth the hills in scales and the mountains in a balance regards a human soul as of infinite value. And the reason it's of infinite value is because it's one of a kind. And you know when you only have one of something, it is extremely valuable. It is priceless. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 186, Ellen White states, the soul is of infinite value. Its worth can be estimated only by the price paid to ransom it. And it was an infinite price, by the way. Calvary, Calvary, Calvary will explain the true value of the soul. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, pages 21 and 22. One soul is of more value to heaven than a whole world of property, houses, lands, and money. So why are we so interested in accumulating, accumulating that stuff? When Jesus comes, all that stuff's going to burn. But the souls that we have won, we're going to take with us. She says, for the conversion of one soul, we should tax our resources to the utmost. Ministry of Healing, 135. This theme comes through time and again in the writings of Ellen White. If but one soul would have accepted the gospel of His grace, Christ would, to save that one, have chosen His life of toil and humiliation and His death of shame. Christ's Object Lessons 196, the value of a soul, who can estimate? Would you know its worth? Go to Gethsemane, and there watch with Christ through those hours of anguish, when He sweat as it were great drops of blood. Look upon the Savior uplifted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look upon the wounded head, the pierced side, the marred feet. Remember that Christ, what? risked all, and the Father also risked the security of the universe. Remember that Christ risked all. For our redemption, heaven itself was imperiled at the foot of the cross, remembering that one sinner, that for one sinner Christ would have laid down His life, you may estimate the value of a soul. Great Controversy 21, the loss of even one soul is a calamity infinitely outweighing the gains and treasures of a world. And one final one, the Home Missionary, December 1, 1894. Jesus, the world's Redeemer, gave His precious life to save fallen humanity. Every son and daughter of Adam is His purchased possession. He paid the infinite price, the ransom money in His own precious life to redeem man. Therefore, he identifies his interest with suffering humanity. And marvel of marvels, Jesus will be one with us forever. In John 3.16, it doesn't say, For God so loved the world that He lent His only begotten Son. He gave. Ellen White says He gave Him to us. He's ours forever, retaining human nature. He is one with God, and He's one with us. Did you understand what we studied? Now, let me conclude with this. 
it is stated today that if you don't believe that women and men can fulfill the same functions in the home and in the church, then you believe that women are inferior to men. In the light of what we've studied, that simply is not true. God has called men to be the elders and pastors of the church. They are to be husbands of one wife. The man is to be the head of the household. The Bible is clear, both in the home and in the church. But the argument today is, no, the man and the woman are both heads. Last I knew, when a person has two heads, that's a monster. <laughs> right? The Bible makes it very clear that he established that the man is the head in the home and a man needs to occupy the position of elder or pastor of the church. Does that make the wife inferior to the husband? Does it make the women in the church inferior to the elders and to the pastors? No! It's just a different function. Just like Christ is subject to His Father, they both have dominion, but the Father is the King, He's the great Creator, and Jesus uh, is subject to the authority and to the will of the Father. The same is true of husband and wife and the leadership structure in the church. It is not rocket science. But what is happening today is that those who are to be subject are saying, no, we don't want to be subject, we want to be there. Are you with me or not? Mm -hmm. And that is the very attitude that started this whole mess on planet Earth, and first of all, in Heaven. So God's way is always the best way. And in eternity future, all of us are going to have different functions. There are some that are going to have higher functions than others, higher responsibilities than others. Ellen White says that there are high angels and lower angels and still lower ranks of angels. Lucifer wasn't happy. He says, I don't like being under the leadership of Christ. You know, I'd like to ascend and be higher than that. So if that's the attitude today, we're in deep trouble. Because Jesus said that the greatest is the one who descends to the lowest position to serve. May that be our spirit is my hope and my prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for making these things so clear in your holy word. We want to occupy the position that you give us, not the one that we want. We want to act in dependence to you. We don't want to act independently. We ask that your will will be done. We pray, Lord, that you will be with your world church. There are huge issues facing the church this summer. I ask, Lord, that you will give all of the delegates the humility of heart to study these things, to look carefully at all of this, that they might make decisions that will be a great benefit to your church, to reaching out to the world. We thank you, Father, for having been with us, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.